You're listening to West Bend's podcast, Music for a While. This podcast is sponsored by Finley and Associates. As an organization, their mission is to inspire leaders, co-create solutions, and deliver impact. Based in Calgary, Canada, Finley and Associates serves clients across this country's major cities. We are so grateful for your continued support as our Galaxy sponsor. Joining West Bend's Artistic and Managing Director, Brian Finley, today is violinist Amy Hillis. Hillis completed her Master's of Music at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and her Bachelor's of Music at McGill. Amy now collaborates with performers and composers around the world to explore new approaches to classical and contemporary music. We are delighted to be premiering Amy's digital concert from the barn on November 20th. If you have found this podcast later, not to worry, this concert will be available for the rest of this year at our digital venue. Visit www.westbenddigitalvenue.ca today to see all of our digital concerts and content. Thank you so much again for listening and enjoy today's episode. Amy Hillis, howdy, how are you doing? I'm great, Brian. How are you doing? Great. How are things in Montreal? What's going on? Montreal's great. It's uh, We haven't got any snow yet, so um, as of this conversation. Uh, there are still some beautiful colors on the trees, mountains looking gorgeous. And uh, yeah, things are things are good. Beautiful. Well, tell me, here's your skill testing question to start off the, the whole thing. What do Regina, San Francisco, Montreal, and Campbellford all have in common? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm to be super self-centered, it would be that I have performed in all of those places. And I've lived in three of them the first three that you mentioned awesome so you're from regina then originally yes yeah fantastic so and here you are in montreal so what's a what's your day like look like today in montreal what are you what have you been up to what do you what merriment are you up to yeah so this morning i got up and the first thing i got to do was i got to talk with a bunch of first years at york university um about vivaldi and his four seasons and that was really interesting because i also got to tie in a a new project um that i'm not personally involved with but some wonderful people who are close colleagues of mine are it's called the uncertain four seasons and it's the vivaldi's concerti recomposed for specifically cop 26 um, to show how the seasons have changed with our current climate crisis so that was really an interesting project to talk about with this relatively younger generation um, but of people who are really concerned about that and then to see how music that's 300 years old can uh, raise awareness about something that's very relevant today so that was really interesting and stimulating And then um, I'm also teaching some courses myself at York University, so I was prepping for those and meeting with some teaching assistants and doing all that. And then otherwise, um, I'm uh, currently preparing for a tour with my duo partner, Megan Molatz. She's a pianist. We're going on tour to BC in January, and so we're playing a whole new program of repertoire, a real mix, a real variety. Um, The theme being sort of extra musical stories, so uh, everything from Dance Macabre to a new piece that I commissioned from Vince Ho that's got movement titles like the Joyful Orangutan and the Golden Horse. So there's, there's something for everyone with this program. So I'm having fun. Oh, that's great. Well, that's a full day right there. Have you done your Viotti yet? (laughs) Viotti. <laughs> I don't think I've done Viotti since high school, thank God. But that's, uh, I know, I know that uh, a lot of people um, get off on that. And that's, you know, I, I certainly have to have a proper warm up. But right. uh, okay, well, I, yeah. you must be really looking forward to to getting back to performing in, in real life and actually to touring because you're quite a busy tourer, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, touring is a lot of fun because you actually get to share with other people in a rather short amount of time um, all your work and the work of the composers and the work of the music. Sometimes that's, in Vivaldi's case, 300 years old. So instead of being cooped up in your little office, which we've had a lot of that this past year and a half, Touring is the opportunity where you not only get to share your work, but then you also get the feedback and you get other people's opinions and ideas. And yeah, I mean, that's what that's what music's about. It's about the discussion. 
Absolutely. Well, let me take you back, maybe not 300 years, although 300 years has great relevance for us and you here at West Bend, because you did one of our most unforgettable performances of all time with your with your performance of the Vivaldi Four Seasons a few years ago here at West Bend it was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, and um, this last July, you visited us again to record a digital concert. And we're so looking forward to the premiere of this digital concert coming up on uh, November 20th. So that's just around the corner. Um, what was it like to uh, to come back to West Bend and and how did it feel? Because one time you had a thousand people in front of you and this time you had two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's funny how there are certain places when you're a performer where even if you've only been there once and usually when you go do a performance, that means you're only in the city for two days maximum. Um, but there are certain places when you come back, it feels like home somehow. And I'm not just saying this because it's you, Brian, but there, <laughs> there's definitely a real community and a real family feel at West Bend. Everything from the person I stay with, Barb, she's one of my new best friends as of the first time I stayed with her because not only is she super knowledgeable about music, but we talk about tennis and nerd out to politics. Anyway, she's a wonderful person. So it's always fun seeing her again and then seeing you and seeing the whole team at West Bend. And we had really an amazing team, the videographer, the recording engineers, the people who would pick up and go from setting to setting because we were not just in the bar the whole time. And so right. that uh, certainly poses its own set of concerns, but everyone worked so well together. And so you really feel supported. You don't feel um, you don't feel like you're doing it on your own. And whenever you have that team effort, particularly as a quote unquote soloist, it certainly takes the edge off and it just makes you feel like, okay, I can, I can do what I do best. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, it was so fun to have you. I mean, it's just, it's a party when, when you come to town, so it's great, but you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, being a solo violinist, this, you truly were a solo violinist. This was only music for only solo violin, no piano accompaniment, nothing else. What uh, what led you to develop such a fascinating program? I have a feeling these are not unique, uh, that you, you, you're you a very interesting explorer musically. So how did you come up with this program? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I wanted to share um, some music that I thought not only used the violin really well, because that's you, you would think that that would be the case with, with almost every professional composition, but not necessarily. And, and I thought all these pieces um, got around the instrument really well. So there's a practical aspect. Um, but then there's also the aspect of, I, I thought each composer had their own unique voice and I wanted to share those different styles, those different voices. So, you know, there's some Bach and that is something that I feel uh, as a performer, you can certainly lend your own individual voice as well as then try and honor Bach's voice. And then I, I sort of carry that mentality into the more uh, uh, recent works, composers that wrote for the violin either in the past century or even are still living today. So we have composers like Rena Ishmael from, she's American, but she has a East Indian background. And I think her musical voice shows her diverse identity that way. Um, and then music by Vince Ho from Calgary. And that was a lot of fun performing his morning song out in a forest where you can really just be inspired by nature as he was when he wrote the piece at 5 a.m. as the sun was rising. Um, and then a Métis fiddle piece by Wesley Hardisty, who has a completely unique voice that is actually one I would certainly not consider um, exclusively in the classical genre, but one that sort of bridges uh, the worlds and and uh, gets rid of any boundaries that we we have. So maybe opens up the world of solo violin in a way that audiences and myself didn't think about. So so I'm trying to with this program to basically give a little bit of everything, but then open up our ears to other styles, other ways of composing and um, unique voices from these fabulous composers. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's a really, really interesting set of of, uh, of pieces. You mentioned that you played the, the Vincent Ho piece, Morning Song in the Forest. 
And uh, that just leads me into talking about your violin, because I remember we uh, we did shoot some of this. There it is right there. OK, we'll talk about that in a sec, because we did shoot some of this of your concert in the Mary West Conservancy, which is located just beside West Van here. Uh, and it was a it was a very it was kind of a volatile day, if you remember. <laughs> and I remember asking you, do you mind playing in the forest? And you said, oh, sure. No problem. That'll be just great. I just as long as you know it doesn't rain on my violin everything else is okay so we took the whole crew over we had all the equipment all the tripods all the sound equipment the whole thing the drone the, all that kind of stuff and you got your violin out we got everybody all set up and just as you got your violin out click click <laughs> so, <laughs> so we wrapped up everything came all the way back to the bar and did some other stuff and then came back to to do that's my memory of all this kind of stuff but how is it for you to do things like like bach by the brook or bach actually on the brook <laughs> as it were yeah barefoot on the bridge over the brook so i had to kind of really center myself for those of you who may or may not have seen me in performance when I did the Vivaldi, I move a lot as a performer. I don't, that's a, you know, whether that's a good thing or not is very debatable. But um, when I was recording the Bach, if I moved, I would be in the brook. So <laughs> I really had to kind of just center myself, which was really actually, it was like you found kind of an inner peace. It was very meditative. And I felt that that was actually quite helpful and maybe brought uh, a solidity or at least a, a sense of gr being grounded pathos, to the Bach. Even, and, yeah. and then you've got birds chirping and you've got the sounds of nature. And so what is quite different is when we play Bach as violinists, we're often thinking of this Baroque sound. And if you think of a Baroque church, it's got these huge mm -hmm. arches and these domes. And as a result, it's very wet acoustic. There's a live acoustic to it. We sometimes call it the second instrument in a piece by Bach for solo violin. When you're playing outside, you have no acoustic. I mean, you have an acoustic, but you have very little resonance. And so that was, very interesting because at first it's a bit disarming because you think oh you can hear the microphones are picking up every little um imperfection in my sound and it's not the blossom of sound but then what was really liberating about that was it felt oh well perhaps this is because i can't have the same resonance i would have in a big duomo um, this is now all about the naturalness of the playing. So I, I felt, well, I'll, I'm just going to speak Bach from the heart. It's, it's like, it's like bearing yourself naked. It's just like, well, here I am, yeah. here's Bach, here's it naked on the violin without any acoustical help. Um, but then there's something very honest about that. And I think generally speaking, we also made it, you know, it doesn't sound too imperfect, but there's a, there's a humanness to it, which often um, we don't associate with Bach. We associate with his music being godly and transportive, but I think maybe this might be transportive and, and, uh, and human. yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And I think, you know, you mentioned nature and the birds singing too because nature plays such a big part in this. And it's so wonderful. There is, of course, the acoustic aspect of this, but there's also the visual, which is very, very special. And to see, you know, the sun dappled uh, grounds and to watch the water flow beneath the bridge as you're playing this beautiful music on it. It's as if it's as if nature is dancing to the, to the music that you're making. So it's actually, it's quite a significant expert experience um can you tell us a little bit about your violin that doesn't like to be out in the rain yes so don't worry Canada Council it did not get rained on I promise <laughs> and I say that because I don't actually own this violin I'm very very lucky to have this violin on loan from the Canada Council's musical instrument bank so this is a bank of instruments about 20 violins or so um as well as about five or six cellos now um, that you get for a three-year loan. Um, and so I'm actually in my final year of this loan. Uh, this is an Enrico Roca violin. And when I say that, I mean it was made by a luthier named Enrico Roca. And he was from Italy. He made this violin in 1902. So it's about 119 years old, 
but it's also not the oldest phylum in the bank. And I was talking about this actually with some students this morning that, well, what does it mean? How did violence change over the years? Well, part of it was, and this is a very much a generalization, but if we go from Baroque period to 20th, 21st century, violence became more powerful. Hmm. They, they developed a bigger sound and very often a sound that could really cut through. So because you weren't relying on this natural acoustic as much as in Baroque times, you were uh, you were really trying to cut through an orchestra, or compete with a big piano, and and that's what I enjoy about this instrument is it has a very very full powerful sound, mm. um, and what's been fun about the journey of playing on this particular violin is you always have a clarity of sound, but my discovery process with this instrument it's like a relationship with a person you sort of learn more about it every day and they. I, I'm saying like it's a living thing, but it's very close to being something that gives back to you depending on what you ask from it. Absolutely. And so I got to discover, okay, what colors can this instrument create? It's different from other instruments, other violins I've played, but then also how can I create the colors that I really would like mm -hmm. to um, hear and that I may have heard on other instruments, but how can I use the strengths of this violin as well as what I know is possible out there? And so then it's funny how it actually changes over time. Like this violin sounds different than it does, than it did three years ago when I first picked it up. Yeah, it's so amazing. it's like having a person in your life, isn't it? That you, absolutely. you converse with them and you grow with them and you, you understand them differently and they understand you differently. And it's just such a wonderful exploration. Well, what happens at the end of three years to you personally? when you when you go back to Canada Council and you <laughs> you give it back but what's nice is that you you realize that okay my ears are now open to that whole sound world that's why I, you you kind of keep that um you, you don't lose the the sense of colors and the sense of different timbres and textures um so yeah you give it back and then someone else can have that experience and that's why these instruments are really um, they're on such interesting journeys, like this instrument has been played by some great Canadian violinists, and then after three years, it's on to the next person and the next generation, so. And not only yeah. that, but it's played in the woods, so. Yeah. That's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> well, Lots I'm sure it's got, it, it's got stories to tell, I'm sure, with you in your hands, for sure. Well, Amy, uh, what is next for you? What's going to happen in the next few years for you? Where is your career going and what, what kind of fun things are you are you looking forward to? Yeah, so I'm really excited to have sort of a lot of pots on the stove. And I think that I I would love to keep that um, be a part of my career that I don't just focus on one thing. I really enjoy teaching. I have I'm very lucky to have this professorship at York University School of Arts, Media, Performance and Design. Um, so I really, really enjoy working with students and hearing their ideas and sharing mm -hmm. my expertise in, in whatever musical subject that may be. But then I also really enjoy performing and I really enjoy curating programs and I really enjoy working with living composers. So I hope to do more commissions. I hope to do more touring with my duo partner, Megan. I hope to play in some chamber ensembles, which is probably the thing I miss the most about um, this past year and a half is not being able to just um, on the fly get together with a quartet and play music. So. Yeah, I mean, just hopefully lots of new discoveries. I think stuff. I never want to be in one one lane and stay there. Yeah, well, I love the way you explore and I love how you express it. And I love your passion over over mm -hmm. all that exploration. Good on you. Thanks, <laughs> And Brian. I think you better work into your plans a little trip back to West Bend to, to play for us live. We would absolutely love it. I know everyone would just go nuts to, to see oh, you again. With pleasure. So, so we will certainly do that in the future. For now, Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're uh, again. I hope you enjoy your concert as much as we enjoyed putting it together from this end. It's uh, it's really a, a beautiful, beautiful trip. And as I say, it's going to be premiering on the West Bend YouTube channel, which you can access from the West Bend website or from our digital venue. And there's some some details will come up about that in a couple of seconds. But we're looking at November 20th, and then it'll be running online for a year after that. So. We're absolutely thrilled to have had you here and can't wait to see you again. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure, Brian. Nice to see you. Thanks, Amy. Take care.